All right, now let's talk about uh, speciation, the process of the formation of new species, or what we call macro evolution. Um, all right, so first, how do we define a species? Well, the typical way is they are organisms that can interbreed or essentially do interbreed under normal conditions, okay? Um, so for example, there are species of organisms that live in, say, Europe and North America, and we consider them separate species, um, partly because they look somewhat different, but also because under normal conditions, again, they don't get together to breed. Um, now, if you brought them together in a zoo or botanical park or something, they might interbreed, but we still tend to call them separate species. Um, so, I mean, wolves and coyotes can probably interbreed to a certain extent, but we still consider them separate species because they really don't, um, and they have a quite distinctive look from each other. All right, but over time, as we sort of left off in the previous video, sometimes a particular species, their populations can become separate from each other, and if they become different enough, they um, and they begin to really not interbreed with each other, we can consider them separate species, and the process of speciation has occurred. And so in this silly example here, you can see we have a chart where back, and we're going in time here, so this is the past and this is the present. So there was some species in the past that in its that form that it existed then no longer exists, but it has given rise to these other species through this branching process. Um, so one species has given rise to four. And essentially in this, this, this diagram, wherever you have a branch point, that essentially is a speciation event that occurred sometime in the past. <clears throat> All right, so so again, somewhat by definition, what's required to have speciation occur and new species form is a certain degree of reproductive isolation. So those subpopulations become isolated from each other and no longer interbreed. And then they tend to go off on different evolutionary trajectories at that point. So what are some of the ways they become isolated? Well it can be behavior. So they may live in the same area generally, but the subpopulations begin to behave in different ways. Um, so a good example we're often given is what's, what's with metal larks. And you look at these two metal larks and you can see they look pretty much the same. Um, not a whole lot of difference between them, at least by their physical phenotype. But they have somewhat different behaviors and even though it says here one is the western meadowlark and one is the eastern, they do have an overlapping range. But even within that overlapping range, they don't interact with each other or breed with each other. And perhaps in class, or you can click on these links and they'll take you to a site where you can hear the songs they sing. And the songs are quite different. And so an eastern meadowlark doesn't really respond to or recognize the song of a western meadowlark and vice versa. <clears throat> so they've essentially evolve different behaviors which keeps them separate from each other or, or not not interbreeding. Well an obvious isolating mechanism would be geography um, where the two populations essentially just have no access to each other. They're in different places and so many millions of years ago um, Panama, parts of Panama particularly down here were lower than they are now and were underwater and so there was essentially a connection between the Atlantic and Pacific but then because of the movement of tectonic plates and uplifting of the land and changes in sea level essentially the Panamanian land bridge formed and blocked off the Atlantic and Pacific and so what presumably at one time were a single population of um, of crayfish that lived in the waters around Panama then became separated and so on the Atlantic or Caribbean side and the Pacific side you had different uh, species begin to develop so that isolation kept them apart 
and again, as time went by, they began to diverge into different populations on the Caribbean and the Pacific side. Temporal isolation, temporal, that means in time. So um, if subpopulations begin to um, be active at different times of the day, or in the case with these skunks here, again, an eastern and western spotted skunk, but there is an overlap between them. The way their time is out of sync is that they have a different breeding season. And so they're ready to mate at different times of the year. So that means the eastern ones just mate with each other and the western ones just mate with each other. They don't mate with them. They don't mate between them because they're not, that's not my time of year to mate, they might say. And so that keeps them separate, separated from each other, even though they're geographically in the same area, but temporally in time, their schedules don't match, you might say. And so that's allowed them to develop into different species. So another thing that's not all that unusual when it comes to the formation of new species and, and is particularly prominent on islands is that you have what's called the founder effect. So in this example, we have a mainland area and there's this population of beetles and there's different phenotypes of them, but it's all one population. But if for some reason a subset of them disperses to an island, either a storm blows them there or they just happen to leave. And so again, it's a small sub subset of the population. If it just so happens to be, in this case, only red ones, then they are the founders of this new population. And their gene pool, you might say, is different from, from the original population. And so at the beginning, they will have a different, they will have a gene pool that's not representative of their original population. Uh, distribution of phenotypes is not the same. And so if the conditions are somewhat different on this island, that population can begin to, that island population can begin to diverge. So that again, through time, Again, you've got the original population, but now this subpopulation can begin to diverge through time until ultimately you can have two different species, species one and species two. So this founder effect is a common way that new species can form, particularly on islands. Okay, so that's it for that section. Um, we'll talk about it more in class.